we read a few verses again, familiar, and familiar to us because they have been before us several times already in the second letter to the Corinthians and chapter to read just the last verse of chapter 3, but we all with unveiled face, reflecting as a mirror the glory of the Lord, are transformed into the same image from glory to glory, even as from the Lord the Spirit. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, even as we obtained mercy, we faint not, <clears throat> but we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by the manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But and if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled in them that are perishing, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of the unbelieving, that the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should not dawn upon them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. Seeing it is God that said, Light shall shine out of darkness, who shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Now in these hours which we have been spending and are still spending together, we have been brought again to a recognition of the ministry, the service of the people of God, of the church, universally and locally and individually, the ministry to which we are called. We have, says the Apostle, this ministry. And we, as we go on, we <coughs> add and add and add to this ministry, the many things that are said about it, seeing it from its various standpoints and in its various aspects, as we have been doing, seeing what this ministry which is given to us and to which we individually as well as collectively are called. As we get on by no means to the end, but as we get on it becomes necessary and very important that we should focus it all upon its main and its supreme issue. If now, after all that has been said, this time spent, we were asked to put into a brief phrase what this ministry is, I wonder what we should say. I wonder how you would sum up all this that has been said and define this clause here, this, having this ministry. 
if we can only get hold of that <coughs> concisely and precisely be able to see clearly and grasp what this ministry really is and go away with that not a whole lot of teaching things said but the issue of it all what does it really amount to what are we committed to perhaps more deeply than ever what is going to characterize us as some of those called to this ministry what is going to characterize us henceforth in a new a much more positive way can we put it into a phrase? Now, it's not difficult to find in these first four chapters of this second letter to the Corinthians. I remind you that it is mentioned no fewer than 13 times from the end of chapter 3 into chapter 4 and mentioned by one word I'm sure you will realize that this is the heart of the thing if in just a few verses quite a few verses from verse 9 verse 8 of chapter 3 to verse 2 of chapter 4 13 times this whole letter's purpose and object is put into one word and that word is glory now just put a ring round it if you like henceforth you've got the key to the letter but you've got more than that you've got the key <coughs> to all that this ministry committed to us really means it is mm, Nothing other, nothing less than the glory of the Lord Jesus. It will be a long, a very fruitful study to take that word and carry it right through the letter, back into the first letter and through, into and through the second letter and see what it means what the glory of the Lord Jesus really does mean what it is set over against how it solves all the problems how it becomes the dynamic and the all governing concern of the people of God the glory of the Lord Jesus that's the test of everything. It's the test of behavior. That takes us back into the first letter, doesn't it? The behavior which was so unworthy of the Lord Jesus. Conduct of those Corinthians after the apostle had left them. Left them to themselves without his presence and present power and influence <coughs> left them for four years or more how their level fell spiritual life declined and all that came in that is so shameful reproachful unworthy of Christ the glory of Christ stands over against all behavior and conduct what we do and how we live and so much more which is not for the present my occupation I want to come right to this whole question this whole matter of the glory as the governing thing in the active life and presence of the people of God in this world we've said something some things about it already how it works out as you know having commenced with 
a very full recognition of the fact that if the glory of the Lord Jesus is the very object for which the Lord's people are here in this age, it's a costly way. We noticed all that the Apostle said right at the beginning of this matter about the afflictions of Christ, the sufferings of Christ, abounding unto us, and how real they were in his own experience, the costliness of standing for the glory of the Lord Jesus. Now, for time's sake, let us come to this, this fourth chapter. In these first six verses, we have these well-known words, seeing it is God who said, let light be. Literally, that is what is here. God who said, let light be. Now, presently, the apostle will refer to a new creation. This is what is in the back of his mind. God who said, let light be, shined into our hearts to give the light of the glory of God. Shined into our heart the light of the glory in the face of Jesus Christ, who is the image of God. The glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, now in our hearts. We have already dwelt considerably upon the light upon the face of Moses when he came down from the mount, and when he stood before the people to read the word of God, the veil that he had to put on because they could not look steadfastly at his face. The apostle says, in effect, and this is what he's meaning, the light of the glory of God was on the face of Moses, but it could not enter into the heart of the people then. They had not the capacity or the ability to receive it into their heart. <clears throat> but the light in the face of Jesus Christ, same glory of God, now in the face of Jesus Christ, the veil is taken away and has entered into our hearts. It's got inside. That's the change in the dispensation. What was all external and objective has now become inward. Has shined in or into our hearts. God said, let light be. In the first creation, outward objective. In the new creation, inward. Shined into our hearts. Let's pause for a moment with this way in which the Apostle puts it. It's, it's a figurative way. We have to get our mentalities adjusted over many of these things. We, of course, naturally and immediately get mental pictures when it says the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ we quite naturally instinctively think of a, the countenance go to his face but that is not what the apostle is talking about he's only using it as a figure 
The same word is translated in another way in this letter twice. And it is otherwise translated person. You find that in verse 11 of chapter 1. <coughs> Ye also helping together on our behalf by your supplication that for the gift bestowed upon us by means of many thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf. And that word persons there is the same word in the Greek as face in chapter 4. And then you have the same thing again in chapter 8. Chapter 8 and verse 24. Show ye therefore unto them in the face of the churches the proof of your love. Same word, in the face of the churches. You know what that means. Not the physical faces of people in the churches. It means before the people themselves. People themselves. So this word face just means the person of Jesus Christ. Light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the person of Jesus Christ that he is the personal image, embodiment, impress of the glory of God. You know that in Hebrews chapter 1, that is exactly how it begins. The express image or impress of the divine glory. And it is not the shining face as such the apostle, the apostle is speaking about that. Oh, may the God, Lord give us more shining faces. <laughs> that doesn't uh, excuse us. <coughs> excuse our miserable faces. Lord have mercy on us <laughs> for our faces. But the Apostle is saying here, Jesus Christ is the, the personal embodiment and expression of the glory of God and he has been revealed in our hearts. It is the revelation of what Jesus Christ really is and means. His significance in God's universe that has been revealed in our hearts. In our hearts. The apostle based his whole life, or his whole life and ministry is based upon this. It pleased God to reveal his Son in me. The counterpart of the outshining of the glory on the way to Damascus is, he's saying it, it, it didn't stay outside. It got inside. And in that light, as I contemplate, contemplated Jesus of Nazareth, I saw how different he was from what I had thought and believed him to be of old beforehand as I persecuted him. I saw him, who he is, what he is. And I saw him, I saw the effulgence of the divine glory in a man, in a man. Christ was the image and representation of God manifest manifest to faith I think it's a rather wonderful thing impressive thing you no know, we think that we have got a lot of light now about the Lord Jesus Tremendous amount of light about the Lord Jesus. And perhaps we think or imagine that all that we know now is new since he was here in this world. Nothing of the kind. All that we know now and all that ever we shall know are the people of God will know about the Lord Jesus after his ascension was true of him when he was here. 
It was all there. Who he was, what he was, what his significance was, what was vested in him. Everything of eternity was there in the man called Jesus of Nazareth. Nothing has been added to him. He hasn't been enlarged and increased. It was all there. John was able to say, we beheld his glory when he was here. Glory as of an only begotten of the Father, full of grace, truth. It was all there. But no one saw it unless it was revealed to them by the Father. And when that happened, even in the days of his flesh, it was an amazement to those who had the revelation. When he asked his disciples, who do you say? Who do you say that I am? And Peter, by inspiration, <coughs> revelation, illumination, by divine act, said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus said, Blessed art thou, Simon, son of Jonah, Flesh and blood did not reveal that to you. I think Peter himself was as astonished as anybody that he had said that. But you see, it was acts of divine illumination. We're familiar with the two on the Emmaus Road. Jesus joined them. But it distinctly says that their eyes were holding they should not know him. And then at a given moment, their eyes were opened. And they saw him. And what a difference that made. In their return journey and their exclamation when they arrived back in Jerusalem. Their eyes were open. It was all there. Everything was there in him. But no one saw it until God gave them the ability to see. That, of course, is something that challenges us. We shall come on to that probably again in a few minutes. Like that. God. <coughs> Who said, let light be has shined into our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory. What is this ministry? It is the result, the result of a divine fear, something that God has done in us. In every one of us, God has done something which is on the same principle as when this, this earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep and the word of God was proclaimed, let light be. And there was light. A divine fear, an act of the word of God. Now Paul says on the same principle something has happened to us. Something has happened to us. That happening has come from God into our lives. And that is the basis of our testimony, of the church's ministry. Would to God the church were living in the good of it, the whole church. But that was actually true of the whole church. First there's the professing church. I said, and there's the real church. But this is the vocation committed to the people of God in this dispensation, this dispensation to reflect the glory of Christ from our inward being 
The mirror is the mirror of our renewed, regenerated spirit. Reflecting the glory. That's the word here, isn't it? Reflecting the glory. That's the ministry. Now I want to pause here. Why not wanting to multiply words? I do feel we must really be very clear and practical. When we first come to the Lord, when this thing first happens, put it how you will, use whatever form of explanation you may about being converted or born again or whatever it is, the thing, when that thing happens, there is the breaking into us of the glory and the glory does shine out, doesn't it? Isn't it a wonderful thing to you when the Lord Jesus, the Lord of glory, came into your heart? Wasn't it wonderful? Of course it was. With all of us, it was wonderful. Now, when that happened to me, I was preaching in the open air five nights a week. And the other nights, well, they were in preparation for the rest. Week after week, <clears throat> any opportunity to testify to the Lord Jesus, I can see it now, it was just like that. It was also wonderful. Gathered around a whole group of young men come into the same experience and what a glory time it was we were called the glory boys <laughs> glory true but that isn't what I'm wanting to get at we come into experiences of trial, adversity and suffering the apostle is talking much about the sufferings of Christ which are bound unto us and the danger is, as it took place in Corinth, that we should lose the glory. We should lose the glory. That's our peril. In difficulties, adversities and trials, things don't go as we like them to go. Things become quite difficult for us. And don't you, dear Christian friends, put a, a divide between your secular life and your spiritual life and say, well, you see, the things that happen to me, they, they're part of my, my job in this world, the work that I'm doing, the place where I'm having to work. That's one thing, my, my Christian life, well, that's in another realm. Don't do that. Don't do that for a moment. You will find that the assault upon the glory is made more by evil powers than by people. All the people may be the difficult ones, the awkward ones, the ones that give you a bad time. May all be in that human realm you think. But don't forget that if you have been called into fellowship with God's Son, you have been called into the ministry of the glory and there is nothing there is nothing in all your life and our life which the enemy will not take hold of to be cloud that glory. To rob him of the glory in us. It be physical or circumstantial or whatever it is. There's something more than the ordinary happenings and circumstances of human life. Remember that. Some of the young Christians need be reminded of that. We older ones uh, are not ignorant of his devices. We know quite well that the simplest thing in ordinary daily life, as we think, can be a trick of the devil. Trick of the devil. <coughs> that, when that telephone rang at that moment, it was the most inopportune moment that it could ring, but it related to something. We were in prayer getting hold of the Lord. Interruption. There's something more than the thing. 
anything that goes wrong. Oh, it's there are, Paul says, hosts of wicked spirits. Hosts of them. Can't count them. They're everywhere. We don't want to get our eyes on them, but we do want to know, note this, that they are after the glory. Their, their whole attention is focused upon the glory of the Lord Jesus. Now, you can see from some things we've already said, but if you read this letter, this second letter to the Corinthians again, you can see that by a whole host of incidents in this man's life, Paul's life, the reactions of this, this group, this influential, powerful group in Corinth to him personally, discrediting him, defaming him, detracting from his ministry. Trying to expose his weaknesses, his physical disabilities, and saying his personal presence is contemptible, and his speech, his speech, it's contemptible. All these things about him. And then all the other list of things that he gives us, chapter 6, chapter 12. What a lot of things there were all against. And he knew what he was talking about when he spoke of, of hosts of wicked spirits. In the shipwreck, and the many shipwrecks to which he referred. And all these other things. These forces of evil were out to destroy the ministry of the glory of Christ in and through this man. That's the meaning of it. They're after the glory they knew very well that God had shined into the heart of this man the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus was in this heart <coughs> therefore he is a marked man or the glory in him is marked the terrific battle is the battle of the glory That is why, in using this word or term, the veil, the veil, he's used it about Israel. The veil was over their face, it is over their face even to this day. They cannot, they cannot receive the glory. They cannot see the glory. Using that phrase, the veil, he takes it up in another connection. If our gospel be hid, it is veiled in them that believe not, in whom the God of this world hath blinded, lest the light of the glory should shine into them. And that is why the Lord Jesus was so particularly interested in blind people. He seems to have had a particular interest in blind people. No blind person ever failed to have his sympathy, interest, and help. And uh, all that he did for deaf and dumb and everyone else, I'm not saying he wasn't interested in them, it, it seems that the, the instances which stand out most fully in his activities when here, are those and uh, all that he did for deaf and dumb and everyone else I'm not saying he wasn't interested in them it, it seems that the, the instances which stand out most fully in his activities when here are those in relation to blind people. And you know quite well that the giving sight to the blind, the man born blind, 
is in the context of I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. The seeing, you see, the seeing faculty is a divinely given thing for the sake of the glory. Oh, dear friends, this is so challenging to me and to you. The challenge comes here. I don't want to make it difficult, but if I make it difficult for you, I'm making it equally difficult for myself. The challenge comes here. That which we have of truth, of teaching, of what we call technically light. And we have a lot. We have a tremendous amount of teaching. Now, it's only another word, you know, for the word doctrine. Choose what you like. Teaching, doctrine, a tremendous amount of it. There is an immense amount of light. Light. Given to the church. Many of us have come into that realm of large degrees of truth and teaching. And the challenge is here. How much of that really becomes the outshining of his glory. Can we stand up to that? Because, you see, the very principle of in shining is that the light of the glory of God should be in our hearts and should be reflected. Put that in a practical way. How much, when we have finished our course, be it shorter or longer, will people be able to say, thank God for that man, for that woman, because really, through him, through her, I came into a living knowledge of the Lord Jesus. In some fuller way, perhaps, or at the beginning, that the glory of God in the face of Jesus came into my life, as reflected by the mirror of that man and that woman. That's the test of all our teaching. <laughs> now I say, we've got so much of it and yet we deny it in our behavior and our presence. So much that contradicts it, isn't there? And here we are having meeting after meeting, hour after hour, piling up the teaching. The test of it all is not going to be that we have a lot more of what is technically called, technically called light. Test of our being here in these times, this very hour. And its value is going to be, will people be able to see the Lord Jesus? And the glorious Lord Jesus more? Will they? You see, this is exactly what the Apostle was getting at with these Corinthians. There had been a shameful contradiction of the Gospel. Their behavior, their character. Almost every way in that first letter, there was a, a contradiction of the glory. And now he is coming back with the second letter and being on the positive side. He was, so to speak, on the negative, but <laughs> Lord have mercy upon us that the first letter to Corinthians is negative. It's a sledgehammer, isn't it? And a sledgehammer isn't a negative thing, you know. But it was on the negative side of correction, correction, correction. Showing the wrong. Pointing it out. I could not speak to you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal. Now, having dealt with a thing like that, judged it. He now turns over to the positive side and some says in effect, now really Corinthians, the only justification of our existence as the people of God is that the glory of Jesus Christ is shining out from us, has come into us and is being seen and known. 
around us where we are. Fear your mental pictures. Glory to Jesus Christ. Sometimes it is just in our quiet, patient endurance, whereas other people would begin to show their resentment and their bad temper and react to what is done and what is put on them in, in a sulky way, a disagreeable way, with a vengeful spirit. Go down under it. Quiet, steady, humble, patience, endurance, suffering wrong, or rather than doing wrong. That's the glory of Jesus. You know, Peter brings that right out, doesn't he, in his letter. If ye suffer for well-doing, this is just, this is grace with God. This is grace. And what is grace but the glory of God? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, you're putting up with a lot this afternoon, aren't you? But we really do want these times to have practical outcome, don't we? go away and say we had some meetings at Easter and the subject was so and so and the speaker was so and so and a very happy time we got a lot of light oh God save us from just that repeated through the years again and again no it's got to be this that the light has got to get inside <coughs> and then there's to be a seeing in that light of the glory of the Lord Jesus. Glory of the Lord Jesus. Now Paul will go on in a minute about the new creation. And he will say that if any man be in Christ, there is a new creation brought about by this divine fear God said, let light be the result in any man, or down the very personal, individual, if any man be in Christ. On this principle, God said, let light be in that heart. There is a new creation. Same fiat, for a spiritual new creation as for the former material creation. Now, of all the things that belong to that new creation, there's only one that I'm going to mention now. It is this. When God at the beginning, over the chaos and darkness of the unformed world said, let light be and there was light, the coming of the light was only the beginning of a process. It started something. It was not an end in itself. It did not come and there remain, like that, just the existence and presence of light. It set things going, and because of the presence of the light, out of the chaos there came form, order, fruitfulness. In like manner, when the light shines into our hearts, the light of God shines into our hearts in the face of Jesus Christ, in the person of Jesus Christ. It's the beginning of a formation, a constituting of a divine order in our lives. Now, that's so for me to talk to you. It doesn't apply to you, but don't you feel there's some gap somewhere, some gap, some lack, when somebody professes to 
accept Christ and all those disorderlinesses of their life. Hardly need mention them. Outward things <coughs> and other things, their behavior. These things do not disappear. They do not change. They bring their disorderliness over into, the, into Christianity. A lot of disorderliness isn't there in what is called the Christian life. Something lacking, there's a gap somewhere. Maybe that they have not been properly taught, the foundation has not been properly laid, so that they've been made to understand what the Christian life really is, that is, it is a new creation, where old things are passed away. What are these old things that are brought over? Old things passed away because all has become new. Now what I am saying, whether it applies to you in that particular respect or not, behavior and appearance and all that sort of thing, it is not the glory of Christ at all. Not the glory of Christ. I was told some time ago of something that happened at the Keswick Convention. The uh, servant of the Lord was there and walking along the street, saw a girl coming towards her in a miniskirt and a lot less in other things than is modest. Hair well, you know all about it. And on her, a placard. A text. A text. Wearing a text. I forget what the words were. Something about it. the Lord Jesus. Coming to the Lord Jesus. It was this. This dear servant of the Lord saw this poor child coming along like this. A heart ached. She felt ill. And so she spoke to the girl. Do you really feel that this commends your master? Do you really think that this is to the glory of the Lord Jesus? You evidently profess to be his. You want to show the world, but do you really think that this will convey a right impression of the Lord Jesus? The girl, her face dropped. I never thought about it. Never occurred to me. No one ever said anything to me. But, well, the work was done, the girl went and changed, and it was put all right. But you see what I mean? Now, it doesn't apply to any of you. <laughs> but the principle is this, that there are lots of old things that have got to go when Jesus is revealed in the heart, they are incompatible with the Lord Jesus. They are a contradiction to him. And if we really do see the Lord Jesus, not in those things that I have hinted at, but in many other ways we'll be putting things right, you know. We will shed many old things. We cannot point is we cannot really see the Lord Jesus and going on in any way that contradicts him. That's the message of this letter. And after all our teaching the test arises have we seen, is it evident, is it evident for this is reflecting as a mirror the glory is it evident that we have seen him? Not seen through teaching. Is it evident in our home that something has happened in us? In our place of work? Not only, and sometimes not at all by our preaching, by carrying a Bible in our hand, but by us, ourselves our very presence there. 
it evident that something has been done by God in us. That is what we are here for as companies of the Lord's people, as well as individuals. Having this ministry, we have renounced the things of dishonesty <coughs> that are not honestly in keeping with Christ. We've renounced them. Not walking in craftiness or literally not making merchandise of the Word of God, <laughs> using divine things for our own gain and interest of handling the word of God deceitfully. <coughs> Contradiction. But commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. It is testing, it is challenging. Now, you've had to put up with a lot, and I've really been fighting to get to the heart of this thing. Mm -hmm. so I tell you quite frankly, friends, that I'm ministering all over the world to so many and I get very tired of ministry. Very tired of ministry. I often wish the Lord would spare me more ministry for this reason. But there does seem to be such a gap between their knowledge of Bible truth and the measure, the expression of Christ in them. You can have all this truth, as it is called, this light, that is, as it is termed, and meet so much that is unchristlike, unchristlike in the people who have it all. They can be cruel, they can be hard, exacting, like these Corinthians what Paul suffered from them. And they had the truth. He'd spent two whole years, day and night, pouring himself out to that church in Corinth. Well, I hope you're suffering this, not taking it other than with the grace of God. Shall we?